New Hope family, this comes to share with you a progress update on our installation of new media equipment in the sanctuary at New Hope. We've, the installation company has received one set of new projectors and screens, the digital device, which will facilitate streaming worship for us on multiple platforms in our sanctuary and our cabling has all come in. However, we're still awaiting a second set of projector and screens, as well as other critical components. For that reason, we'll continue to worship virtually this Sunday and next Sunday until the first Sunday of September. So I hope you'll join us for virtual worship at youtube.com August 22nd and August 29th. You can participate in virtual worship on our YouTube channel as shared, and we'll return to hybrid worship on Sunday, September 5th, which entails worship both in person and on our YouTube channel that you found us today. Also, New Hope family, we are extraordinarily thankful for your continued faithfulness in giving. As God has been good to you, the Lord has utilized your stewardship to be a blessing to the fellowship, which in turn blesses the community around us. So we encourage you to continue to give utilizing our giving app, givelify.com. You can also give through PayPal at this point, going to paypal.com and entering in New Hope Baptist Church. You can give by mail, and or contacting a member of the finance committee through the church office or by phone personally, and someone will retrieve your tithe and or offering. We are extraordinarily thankful for your continued faithfulness in giving as it indicates to God your thankfulness for all God has done for you and all God's done for me as you and I continue to give to the Lord at New Hope Baptist Church. God bless you and thank you for your faithfulness to ministry at New Hope. Good morning, New Hope family and friends. We thank God for you and we praise the Lord for another Sunday worship experience. We are so grateful today that God has given us life, health, and strength, breath in our bodies, blood in our veins, the activity of our minds, one more day. As we thank God for that, we thank God for worship. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate Children, Youth, and Young Adult Sunday at New Hope Baptist Church. Good morning. Please join me in today's litany. I will be reading as lead, and you will be reading as congregation. Our Father, may we all have the hope and energy and strength of our youth. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. You used a little child to lead a wolf, a lamb, a leopard, a goat, a calf, and a lion to live together in harmony. May it be so today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
New Hope family and friends, we are thankful to God today for our ability as a fellowship to continue to serve God's will in ministry through these last 18 months together of the pandemic. We are grateful to God today for your faithfulness in giving and for all of us, you and I together, continuing to take opportunity to return to God our tithe and our offering. Nichelle and I have been extremely grateful for every opportunity to give because we realize the fortunate privilege we have of being able to return something to God, which is an indication that God is still pouring out to us. But I know I'm not by myself, so I would encourage and invite you today to pour out of what God has given to you. We believe in the tithe. It's 10% of what God has given us at the first of the week. We return back to God in the tithe, and we believe in offering, meaning simply that God blesses us with gifts that we don't expect, 
and things that we weren't sometimes even looking for. As a matter of fact, God blesses us also with provision, things that show up when we need them most, opportunities that are open that no one could have provided but God. Whichever your testimony today, I invite you to apply that in this moment as you and I together return to God with our tithe and our offering. You can give today by utilizing the giving app, givelify.com. You can also give on the on the web at paypal.com. Though the church website is down temporarily, you can go to paypal.com and type in New Hope Baptist Church and still give there. You can also give by mailing in your tithe and or contacting a member of our finance committee through the church office to come and retrieve your tithe and your offering. Whichever method you choose, we thank God for your faithfulness in giving and for your expression of gratitude to God. Lord, I know where all of my blessings come from. Therefore, I return to you this tithe. God bless you as you give. Good morning. Today's scripture is Luke 18, verse 15 through 17. Then they also brought infants to him, that he might touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Amen. New Hope family and friends, won't you help me to thank God for our children, youth, and young adults who have blessed our hearts in worship today. Won't you help me? Let's praise God for our young people who have ushered us into the presence of God's spirit. Come on, let's give God praise. And as we praise God today, let's praise God for the way that God has filled the hearts and minds of these young people who have endured so many things in these months gone by and have yet returned to schools in this past week who have re-entered buildings, gone back to classrooms, made trips back to college campuses across this country to indicate to you and to me that they know that God is able to do all things. Well, let's praise God today for our young people at New Hope Baptist Church. Come on, let's give God praise. Won't you put some praise in the timeline, in the chat, in the comment section. Lift, God, lift your voice wherever you are. God is worthy of our praise, and our young people need to know that we thank God for them. Amen. As we thank God for them, I also want to take a moment to thank God for our ministerial team, who in my absence on vacation uh, did an outstanding job of continuing leadership models here in this wonderful fellowship. I want to thank God for Reverend Jerry Oaksner, for Reverend Clifton Morgan, for Minister Lauren Johnson, for Minister Javon Bracey in her absence from us, uh, and for uh, Minister Thomas Martin, and last but not least, Reverend Quincy Shannon. We thank God for Reverend Shannon, who will deliver the word today. Reverend Shannon has been working with young people here at New Hope Church for a number of years now. But more than that, Reverend Shannon comes to us well-versed and equipped in the needs of young people in our community. Reverend Shannon is a social activist in the Denver metro area, a poet, an avid outdoorsman, and leader, in fact, of a nonprofit organization uh, purposed to expose young people to the outdoors in Colorado. And finally, Reverend Shannon is a faculty member at DSST Green Valley Ranch, where he works with young people every day. We thank God for Reverend Quincy Shannon. We know God has poured a message into his heart that he's going to pour out to us. So I want to invite you today to pray for Reverend Shannon that God has spoken to his heart and that these words might bless your life in such a way that you might share them that somebody else may be blessed also. So why don't you and I together turn our hearts now as we listen in to the word God's given. After this choir shall come, the next voice you hear will be that of Reverend Quincy Shannon. God bless your family and may heaven smile upon us all.
First, giving honor to God, who is the supreme ruler of my life in which I strive to effectively be used by, to the under shepherd of this flock who has graciously shared his sacred desk. I'm thankful for an opportunity like this. And for each and every one of you all, I want you to know there is a word from the Lord. And so I'd ask that if it's safe for you to do so, that you bow your heads, or that you close your eyes and open up your heart for this word of prayer. O oh God, our God of ages past, our hope for years to come. You've been the shelter from a stormy blast and our eternal home. Before there was earth and water stood and earth received her frame. That is why from everlasting to everlasting, we will praise your name the same. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. You are the potter, we are the clay. Make us and mold us in the way that we should go. Set guard over the doors of my lips, Lord that only yours come out, for you are real, and we need to hear from you at this time. So we ask that in your most humble name that we do pray. Take this service, Lord. Ashe and amen. Our scriptorial text comes from the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, verses 6 and 17 through 22. Once again, the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, verse 6 and of 17 through 22. And it reads, verse six, so when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them and the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And the Holy Spirit has entitled this message, Lessons Before the Blessing. Lessons before the blessing. 
As we sit in times like these, it's very easy to look out and see some of the perils that face us in the world. I was surprised when I was scrolling through social media earlier this week and I saw a plane on a runway and there were hundreds, if not thousands of people trying to grab hold to the plane as it was taking off as we think about refugees who were thinking it would better to cling to a plane as it was getting ready to take off than stay where they already were. What does it feel like to live in a reality where where you are is so uncomfortable, what you're dealing with is so challenging that any type of relief is something that you would seek. As we think about the COVID pandemic and the Delta variant and the challenges in which it has brought, as we think about schools still wearing masks in some location, as we think about those thinking about the vaccine or not having the vaccine, we can understand the perils of the reality that there are some individuals literally scared to step out of the house in which they live, the shelter in which gives them comfort at night because they're afraid of what they may catch. And who can blame them? When, when we relive in a reality right now where we treat the way if you're vaccinated similar to how we used to treat racism, you cannot eat here if you don't have this card. You're not allowed to sit you and your family in this location if you can't prove this thing. And I understand being safe, but what is the precedent in which we set when we're not able to go out of our house and speak to our neighbor because we don't know what their status may be? Changing our focus, we start to realize that sometimes it feels uncomfortable just to be in the mess. And I know some of my super saved Christians may not be understanding all of what I may be saying right now, because every time you come to church and sit in your same seat, every time you've come with your favorite outfit on, the Lord has done everything in which you've asked him to do. But I'm talking to the few people who can understand what it's like to reach up in your midnight hour, ask God for something, wake up in the morning and realize it still has not come. This is for those who know what it's like to be in a hospital sick, ask to be healed from the sickness, and the doctor comes in and says, I'm sorry, but the cancer has not gone away. For the individuals who knew that the family member was dealing with something deep in their lives, had prayed to God to deliver them, and got the phone call later on that week that they took their own lives. For those who understand what it feels like to ask God for something and to feel as if they've been denied. Well, I'm here to tell you that there are blessings and lessons that we can get before the blessings. That God is still in the blessing business even if the blessing doesn't come when we want and glory be to God that even in the times that we find ourselves in the fire, even in the times when we feel we're still in the lion's den, even in times when things don't go the way in which we would want, that God can still say, there's a lesson before the blessing. Follow me to our scriptural text found here in the Gospel of John where we are introduced to some characters in which we understand Jesus in a way that we're not used to seeing him. You see, we understand that Jesus was in a location in verse six, it says, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two days in the place in which he was. Now, to understand how profound this context of this sermonic text would be, you have to understand a little bit more about Jesus and Lazarus' relationship. You see, it says in the scriptural text that the one in which you love is sick. Meaning Jesus and Lazarus were friends, if not better than that, they were homies, people who had engaged and worked with each other. Matter of fact, this was the very same Mary who had gone to Jesus and washed his feet. This is the very same Mary who loved Jesus to sacrifice certain things for, and now her brother is sick. They write a letter to Jesus saying, the one in which you love needs you right now, my master, my savior, my Lord, the one who I pray to, the one who I come to, and Jesus says that he stays two more days. What is it like when you pray to a father that doesn't come to you immediately in the time in which you think that you need them? What does it feel like when you find yourself in a context of a reality in which the lessons that you're getting before the blessing don't feel good? 
they don't feel right when the loved one that you loved transitions from labor to reward. When the job that you knew you were qualified goes to somebody else, when the home that you thought that you were getting ready to close on is the home that you are no longer given the loan application for, what is it like when you fall in love with somebody feeling like you would be able to be the one that could share a happily ever after and you find out they're cheating and they go with someone else? Mary and Martha reached out to Jesus. But instead of Jesus coming right when they wanted him, it says that he intentionally stayed where he was at two more days. As I think about this very profound text, it's something that reminds me of, for some reason, of lifeguards. No, not lifeguards at your local pool. Not even a lifeguard that we would think that would be in the sandlot, you know, the pretty one that they tried to kiss. Not even the type of lifeguard that is going to be at Waterworld who may or may not be fully qualified because they don't normally have to do too much but stand there looking good. I'm, I'm talking about the lifeguard at the Olympics. I don't know if you've ever watched the Olympics, but when you have the 100 meters and all the different type of events that happen at the pool, they actually have a lifeguard sitting there. Now, this was profound for me because you mean to tell me that there's somebody who gets paid to sit, to be prepared, to jump in for folks who are professionally trained, who are the top of their class in a sport, just in case they cannot swim or need them. I, I know the joke seems amazing, but as I was thinking about this profound opportunity, I learned about something that happened at the 2000 Sydney Games. You see, there was a young African named Eric who was getting ready to swim and actually had only started swimming a few months prior to the Olympic Games. Now, I know this may seem odd to you because when we think of the Olympics, we think about the tops. We think about the best of the best, the brightest. Well, this young man came from a place in Africa in which swimming was not a sport that most people did. Matter of fact, when you look at his story, it says that he would actually practice in the only pool in his country that was located in a hotel a few miles away from his house. Because the hotel was open during the day, he would say he would wake up bright and early in the morning and jump in the pool and swim and practice swimming, but it was only 13 meters wide. Now, for those who have ever watched an Olympic game and ever watched the 100 meters within there, you would know that a, an average Olympic pool is 50 meters wide. But this young man had started practicing and represented a part of the country that does not normally get invites and was invited to the Sydney Games. When you look at his story, it says that he had stopped in countries he had never even been to, took three days to make it to the Sydney Games, and there he was at the great stage. It, it talks about him, him walking into where the, the pools were at and seeing just how wide and how long that pool actually was. When you look at his story, he says that he was afraid because the pool that he had ever practiced in was only 13 meters wide and now he's seeing full teams practicing and he said he would sit down and watch the Olympic training squad and he would try to practice and see what their strokes looked like but realized that he didn't swim the same and said that the African, the South African swim coach actually came to him and said, are you a swimmer? Because when I watch you dive in, when I watch you turn over and do what you're supposed to do, it just doesn't look right. And, and he said that he was intimidated, but he was there for a reason, that he wanted to continue to swim. And so now we're here for his event, the 100 meters. He's on the podium. He, he's getting ready to dive in. There's other Olympians to his left and to his right who are more qualified, more trained than him, that have been used to the pool in which they're in and used to being able to swim the full length of it. And he said his, his legs started to shake and his body started to ache and that he started to feel like maybe I should just go home. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know that there's some who have felt what he has felt who have gotten to board presentations that you did not feel qualified for, who have gone into courtrooms in which you didn't fully know what to say, who have gone in front of family and friends and had imposter syndrome and did not know if this was the reality in which you should be. You know what it's like to be in front of pools. And more so, fear of drowning that comes. 
And as we think about what's going on in our very profound text right here, we see Martha and Mary getting ready to be on their own pool as they're reaching out to God for what may be one of the most important phone calls that they may have in their life because their brother is sick, their brother is potentially getting ready to die, and they're reaching out to God saying, Lord, please, the one in which you love is sick. Oh, won't you come? What happens at this 2000 Olympic game is a situation many often laugh at when they see the clip. You see young Eric the ill was standing at the podium and they call for them to get ready to jump into the water. Uh, paralyzed by his fear, he does not move. The other swimmers who are on the podium, they actually have a false start and jump in the water. The referee blows the whistle, come, come back. Nobody's able to go because you guys false started. You guys were too eager, too ready, too profoundly wanting to be in the water. And young Eric said that he stood on the podium, thinking that he was disqualified, getting ready to put back on his clothes and walk back into the locker room saying, well, at least nobody has to see me swim. Sometimes, we're thinking of the worst case scenarios, happy that they may happen so that people won't see what is making us the most afraid in our lives. What does it feel like when our deepest fear is not that we are afraid of this thing, but that we are powerful beyond measure, that it's our light not our darkness that makes us afraid when we're worried that we actually just might be good enough, but afraid to show the world that we are. So if something comes up in front of our reality, we gladly take the exit and just take our bow. Well, young Eric was getting ready to put his clothes back on and walk back to the locker room. And one of the referees came up and said, no, sir, G get back where you're at. Your race is not over. You see, everybody else who jumped into the water has been disqualified because they false started, but you now have an opportunity to swim all by yourself. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now. Don't know whose driveway I just pulled in. Don't know whose Kool-Aid I just poured some sugar into. But somebody right now has some blessings that have been placed in front of you that you thought you should run from. Some stages that you're getting ready to have to perform on that you thought maybe I just should exit out of. And God is saying, no, I cleared out all of the competition. I moved out all that was a little bit more ready. I prepared a place for you, for you to go. And now all you have to do is dive in. Young Eric said, well, if he was swimming against everybody else, at least people would have other folks to look at. But now here he is, a person who only started swimming a few months before this, from a country nobody ever really gave any attention to thinking that they would win. And now he has an opportunity to swim his race. Eric jumps into the water, begins his stroke swimming, and he says for maybe the first 25 meters, everything looked good. But then, as he started to continue to swim, getting ready to get to the wall, he realized that all of the energy that he had, all of the adrenaline that he had been feeling is starting to run out. All of the feelings that he had in his legs, in his arms, he's no longer able to feel them. He gets to the other side, flips over, and is getting ready for his last swim to get to that wall. If he can just make it to the wall, if he can just get there, he's almost guaranteed to be a medalist. But he says that as he starts swimming he starts getting tired the little technique that he had picked up he forgot and he said that he called out to God saying Lord if you could just let the lifeguard jump in save me get me out of this situation that I'm in there's been moments when my head's gone below the water. Times when I ran my race and went as far as I thought that I could go, but I started getting tired, started feeling weary, started questioning within my own thoughts and reality, Lord, 
Was I ever really supposed to be here? Was this ever supposed to be what I was going to go through? God, maybe I should just let you jump in and save me. Be the lifeguard to help me in my situation. But one thing that has blessed my soul is that for a swimmer to be able to go the full distance, they can't be afraid to let their head go below the water. That for them to be able to swim the quickest and the swiftest and to make it to where they're going, that they cannot be afraid to let their head get wet. And sometimes we are so busy worrying that our head will go beneath the water. We're looking to our right, we're looking to our left, and we're worried about the distractions that are in our lives that we forget that God has already prepared a place for us, getting us ready for the race in which we have. And that God doesn't always have to jump in and save us just because our heads get wet. But sometimes God is saying, no, I know you're tired, but this race was not given to the swift or to the strong, but to the one who can endure until the end. And so God is looking down in your situation, although dealing with COVID-19 and the Delta variant, although dealing with problems on your job, dealing with friends and family members who don't show up the way that you expected them to. And we're looking to God saying, pull me out of the water. And God is saying, just finish the race. Just endure to the end. And that's Eric's story. He started to get tired had one of the slowest times making it to the end. But he got there, touched the wall, went in an inexperienced swimmer who had never swam in a pool as deep as the one in which he was in and came out an Olympian whose name is known by many where because of his work and what he was able to do at the 2000 Sydney Olympic Games, they started building swimming pools all throughout Africa, realizing that that's a program that other African countries should be able to have and be able to send individuals to the Olympics. And that although he had one of the slowest times to finish the race, he finished. And so God is telling somebody under the sound of my voice, that the lesson before the blessing, before you've reached the wall, before you've come out an Olympian, before you're able to stand on the podium and get your gold, your bronze, or your silver, is God is simply saying the lesson is that you have to just keep swimming. Keep going. I know times are hard. I know things are rough that others are getting blessings that you thought you should be given, that others are given opportunities that you felt more qualified for, that sometimes your midnight hour has you looking up and questioning God and saying, God, if you love me, why would you bring me to this situation? And that's where we find Martha in our text. Because verse 17 says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, and Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. She was in her pool, swimming towards the end. But her brother died. The thing that she prayed for, the thing that she hoped for, the thing that she longed for was denied to her. Because of her relationship with Jesus, she looked her eyes to the hills from which cometh her help. But instead of saying, my help comes from the Lord, she says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. How many of you all can be honest? 
that there's been questions and times that you've looked up to the heavens and instead of raising a holy hand to say how great God is, instead of thanking God for the blessings that you have seen or the blessings that you know you have not seen, thanking God for grace and thanking God for mercy, that there's been times when you looked up to God and said, if you would have been here, this would not have happened. It's all right. Nobody can see you wherever you're watching this recording. It's not like you have to keep your super safe smile on and have to turn to your left and to your right and act like this isn't directed towards you. Because if we can be honest, in this walk that we call a faith walk, in this time in which we've had this relationship with God, if we can truly be honest as Christians here and right now, there's been moments when we've been disappointed with God. Times when we say to God, if you would have been here, this would not have happened. But the lesson that I find in the text is that Martha does not allow that to be the last thing that she says to God. Stop. Keep the recording, move your head over, because some of y'all missed what I just said. That Martha had a moment in which she questioned God, that she was frustrated with God, but she did not allow that to be where she stayed. Come here, the mother who has just buried her baby and had to choose the casket at the funeral home. I know that you may be questioning and mad at God, but don't stay that. Come here young person who was getting ready to take the test to get into the school that you wanted, but you found out that even though you passed the test, you don't have the money to make it to the school. Come here. Anybody who has ever questioned and asked God, if you would have been here, this would not happen. This scripture, this sermon, this lesson before the blessing is for you, that even if you found yourself there, don't stay there. Nobody's telling you that you can't question God, that you can't ask God why, when, what, where. Please help. But in the times when you're frustrated, in the moments when life seems the most complicated, realize that we still serve a God that hears and answers prayer. And so after Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It continues and says, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Sometimes we are placed in situations in life simply to put us in a prostrate position to position us for the ask. That sometimes God knows the power in which he has in our lives. The plan to help you, not to harm you, to save you, not to hurt you. But God needs us to understand that it was him who saved us. Sometimes we get so used to going through the motions that we start to arrogantly think that it was us who has brought us this far along the way. That we look at our bank accounts, we look at our homes, we look at our jobs, we look at our families, we look at the blessings in which we have, and we start to look and say, ha -ha. <laughs> you know I went to that school because I'm smart. <laughs> you know I was able to get that accomplishment because I went after it. I, I'm a go-getter. And we start forgetting that it was God. That God was the one who woke us up this morning and started us on our way. It was God who looked at us even in our midnight hours at times when we did not even know to tell our body to breathe in and breathe out and tapped on our heart and said, keep on beating for my child. It was God who looked at you and said, you were worthy even when you were in your mother's womb and has been moving and ordering and developing your steps in the way that you should go. It was God who has brought us this far along the way. And sometimes God just puts us in situations so that we can acknowledge the power that's beyond us. That the lesson before the blessing is that we serve a God who would never leave us nor forsake us, but sometimes God just needs us to acknowledge that God is God. 
When is the last time that you prayed to God just thanking him for the blessings that you knew about and those that you didn't? When is the last time that you just reached up to God to have a conversation and thanked him for people that you haven't even met yet, but you know that will come along your path? When was the last time that you acknowledged that God has been moving and shaking in your lives in ways that you never even knew you could? That sometimes the storms come in our life simply to remind us that the rain still comes from heaven. That sometimes God puts us in situations just to prostrate us in such a way that we could look up and say, but God, if you can help us, I know that you are God and you can give whatever you ask. Sometimes God just wants you to ask. And so in conclusion of this very profound text, I started looking at it different because so often when we think about Lazarus, we always think about the tomb situation. We think about the fact that Jesus comes and goes before the tomb and tells Lazarus to come forth and Lazarus gets up and walks. But what happens a few verses before Lazarus even is resurrected? When you find yourself in a Martha moment, when you're looking up to God and saying, if you would have, or why, or how could you, or even if you feel sometimes like Mary. That because of the trauma and tragedies that have happened in your life, that you don't even go out the house to see God anymore. That you're just mad, angry, frustrated over it. I'm more spiritual now than I'm religious. I have a, a relationship with things outside of this reality because God has hurt me. The church has hurt me. People in the church have hurt me. And so I'm no longer just going to deal with them anymore. But God is saying, I know you've been hurt. I know you didn't feel I was there when you needed me. But there's some lessons that you need to have before you can get to the blessing. Knowing that God chose to stay two extra days. And I used to get frustrated when I looked at that text. God, why are you acting like I'm Job and you playing with my life? You know I need you right now. Why don't you just come to me? But then I think of Eric. And I think about the fact that if the lifeguard would have jumped in the water, how many Africans following after him would never have had an opportunity to swim? That sometimes God leaves us in the situation as uncomfortable as it may be so that we can gain the lessons that we have that may not always just be for our own edification. That sometimes God uses us to bless those that are around. Our text says, that on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them. That it wasn't just Martha and Mary who were at the tomb when Lazarus was resurrected. But there were Jews in that place. And that sometimes God leaves us in a situation, allows us to endure the hardship because he knows that those who are around us, those who think arrogantly that they can help or that God left or forsaken us, that, that God knows that we can be a blessing for them. If you know what proceeds and comes after this text, then you would know that some of the disciples asked Jesus if he should even go to Lazarus because they knew that the Jews were looking for him. And that even after Jesus performed the act, that the act of him resurrecting Lazarus was one of the things that was used to give him the punishment that would ultimately lead to his crucifixion. But God did it anyway. Knowing the consequences, knowing the risks, that God took what could have become a private act, only in front of Martha and Mary, 
where none of the Jews would have seen, none of them would have been able to go to the Sanhedrin council and say, we saw Jesus do this profound act on this day at this time. We witnessed it with our own eyes that Jesus could have just come to them. Said, y'all know I loved him. Come with me. Watch what I can do. But Jesus, even knowing the risk of doing it with a crowd, did it anyway. Sometimes for a conductor to be able to lead the orchestra, he has to turn his back to the crowd. And sometimes when our backs are turned, that's when the knives can come out. But God being God prevails anyway. And so in the final summation of the text, the lessons that we gain before the blessing is that God still hears and answers our prayer. God sometimes leaves us in situations simply so that we can know and trust and know that God is moving. And that sometimes God does things not just for our own lives, but for the lives of others. So my sincere hope is that if you have ever found yourself in a midnight hour, ever dived into a pool that was deeper, wider, longer than you've ever swam in before, if you've ever questioned God, asking God how, why, did you really mean to, to find hope in this word and know that nothing has been an accident, nothing has been a mistake, and that God is still moving in our lives. With that new hope, be blessed and have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He'll hear your every cry, answer by and by. Ashe. Good night. Today we have gathered here at the altar to pray for special needs. Uh, we thank you that sent in prayer requests. Today we'd like to pray for the hospitality crew. I'd like to pray for the doctors, the nurses, the first line responders. Uh, death is all around them and they're just over flooded hospitals, overran. And we just want to keep them, lift them up in prayer because uh, it's hard being around that type and it's just difficult for them. And you can see the stress in their eyes and on their face. So Lord, we thank you. For this day, we ask that you continue to be with us, and Lord, we ask that you just hear us. We are pressed on every side, of the Lord. As soon as one event happens, something else happens, and we ask that you just be with us. We need to hear from you, O oh God. Lord, I, I, I pray especially for the families, uh, the caretakers, the hospice uh, caretakers. For Lord, they are overwhelmed as well. And Father, for those that are trying to take care of uh, people in their homes, uh, we ask that you be with them, uh, that you lift them up, oh God. And Father, we ask that you uh, be with the teachers as they go back to school. They're faced with uh, angry parents on every side. Some want masks, some don't want masks, oh God. Uh, they have to be in the classroom with our children and to teach them and to, to go with that structure and have this extra layer of uh, stress on them, oh God. So we ask that you be with the superintendents as they make the mandates. Uh, you be with the teachers as they go into the classrooms, as they try to meet with the children that are confused as well. And Lord, there's confusion everywhere throughout the land. We see in Afghanistan that uh, parents are handing their children over a fence to complete strangers just to get them out of harm's way. We see that on the border, Lord, uh, that people are trying to get into the country, oh Lord. People are running away from the oppressor. So, Lord, we need you. I ask that you send your, your, your spirit, your power, oh Lord, that you speak peace into those that are struggling right now, Lord, that you speak healing to those that, that need you, oh God. For Lord, we need you in every aspect of our life. And we ask that you continue to be with us and be with this leadership, Lord, our ministry team, as they bring forth uh, the productions each week, Lord, put a, a special blessing upon them, oh God. And we ask, Lord, that now that as we go throughout and as we prepare to return back to the building, Lord, 
Give us the strength. Give us the knowledge that we need in order to make this happen, oh God. And Lord, bless the people as they uh, return. Uh, give them the strength to, to want to just come back to your house, oh Lord, to, to praise you in your sanctuary once again, oh God. Lord, as I said before, we need you in this hour. We need you in our lives. We need you to just govern and guide us in a way like never before. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come down. We ask that you anoint the vessels that are speaking your word. We ask that you anoint those that are going out and uh, the deacons and the trustees. We ask that you anoint them as they meet the needs of the people. So God, hear our cry. Hear the prayers of those that have called in. We ask in your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. New Hope family and friends, we thank God for this wonderful experience in worship that we have enjoyed together this day. We are grateful to God for you, and we thank the Lord for this wonderful opportunity to unite our hearts with so many things going on in this world. Aren't you grateful today for the way God ministered to your heart as God did me? So won't you now bow with me as we prepare to receive our benediction and give God thanks for this wonderful day. As we do that, we invite you to share this experience with others that they may be blessed as well. But won't you bow? Eternal God, we thank you today. We thank you for the word of this wonderful preacher, oh God, for the prayer that's been lifted that, oh God, lifts our petitions up to you. We thank you, Lord God, today for the songs that have been sung, for young people who blessed us, for the occasion of being able to gather with the people of God, no matter where we may be, Lord, and reminded that you are still with us. Watch over us one and all now, God, as we depart from each other, but never from your presence. And we'll be careful to give you glory, honor, and praise in the majestic name of Jesus. And we say together, amen, amen, and amen. We look forward to worshiping with you virtually here again next Sunday, the 29th. And then we will return to worship in person here at New Hope the first Sunday of September as we share Holy Communion and our return to the sanctuary. At this time, we invite you to just take some moments of fellowship in the comment section, in the chat room or on the telephone line, wherever you may be, as well as sharing this worship experience with others. If you have not already, we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and or Instagram, as well as sharing this worship experience with a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone in proximity, that they may be blessed in the same way God has blessed you today. God bless you, family and friends. We look forward to worship with you again at New Hope.